Hello, everyone. I'm um, Vidya Dinkar. I coordinate Growth Watch in India, and I'm president of INSA. Welcome to what we call the challenges of the energy sector immunity in Bangladesh. This, of course, is organized by the Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt and the School of People's Law. Uh, our rapporteurs for today are Sajjad Hussain Tuhin and Kundi Afaz, our friends and supporters of the Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt. It is a very loose forum of progressive organizations and individuals from Bangladesh who work on multi and their investments, especially in energy, in large infrastructure, in natural resources, and of course, the climate crisis. The working group has 43 active members from all across the country. Uh, the BWGED is currently monitoring different projects, including the AIAIB funded Gola 225 megawatt gas power plant, the ADB um, finance Ruksha 800 megawatt LNG power plant, the JICA financed Matarbari coal power plant, the China Exim uh, financed Gondamara and Paira coal power plants, the Burisal coal power plant financed by Power China, and the uh, different power plants and LNG terminals in Bangladesh financed by the IFC. The School of People's Law is an organization of advocates committed to see that legal instruments are understandable to the people and that they are applied to ensure basic human rights of the citizens of Bangladesh. SOPL works on basic human rights, of course, environmental rights, the right to information, financial accountability, and most importantly, the freedom of speech. The Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt and SOPL um, began working together to challenge the immunity of IFI's international financial institutes. Over the years of journeying together and you know, sitting down on addas that brought forward something fruitful, both the organizations have started working on legal instruments um, of the energy sector together. So um, today, of course, what are we trying to do? Um, uh, we are going to have a welcome speech by the member secretary of the Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt. Um, we are then going to have keynote paper presentations, about 20 minutes each. Um, Barrister Jyotimoy um, Borua, who's an advocate at the Supreme Court of Bangladesh, will uh, speak first. He is also a core group of the School of People's Law in Bangladesh. Our special guest is a very special one, actually. Uh, she will speak for about 15 minutes. Um, advocate Sayyida Rizwan Hassan. She is a very popular and well-known um, uh, advocate of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh and executive director Bangladesh Environmental Lawyers Association, which is very musically called Bela. Um, we have another guest speaker, also an advocate of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh and member of the School of People's Law, uh, Dr. Kazi Zahid Iqbal. After which we'll open it up uh, for 30, uh, 30 minutes of uh, question and answer. And then we'll have closing remarks by Mohammed Zakir Hussain Khan, the Honorary Executive Director of Change Initiative Bangladesh. The usual housekeeping that I need to do uh, we request you to keep your mics muted. Please turn on your mic only when you have been um, given the floor to actually speak. Um, only the three speakers and moderator are encouraged to keep their videos on. Other participants could please turn off your video cameras because it helps everyone um, focus and um, you know, uh, if somebody's bandwidth is a little choppy, it helps. Please ask your questions here in the chat box. Chat box button is on the bottom of your screen. We will give you the mic uh, when your turn comes. Participants who are connected through Facebook, please ask your question to the specific person in uh, your comment. Uh, with, please mention the speaker's name, okay? Uh, who you're expecting the answer from. All the speakers, our request to you is to keep the time in mind. The program, of course, 
um, uh, should not go on more than one and a half hours at the very most. You will get a notice when you have only one minute to finish. So I'm going to play schoolmaster on that. Um, yes. So today, um, let me introduce Barrister Jyotirmai Barua. He's one of the prominent lawyers in the Bangladesh Supreme Court, working to protect environmental and human rights, especially the right to speech and the right to land. He has been working as one of the core members of the School of People's Law, and he is also convener of Life and Nature Safeguard Platform in Bangladesh. Uh, today, we are. Um, what are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to talk about something which has really occupied even the popular imagination in Bangladesh because everyone is tired of load shedding. Uh, everyone has been complaining about intermittent and um, power supply, how it's not uh, reliable, and everyone was just really having enough of this. So um, today we are talking about the immunity that comes through a very important law in the um, energy atmosphere of Bangladesh. It's called the Speedy Supply of Power and Energy, Special Provision Act of 2010. Amidst tremendous criticism, actually, the government enacted the Speedy Supply of Power and Energy, Special Provision Act, um, on October 12, 2010, for a period of two years. Uh, and then in September 2012, uh, the government extended the law for another two years, which was to expire then in October 2014. But in August 2014 itself, the extension of the speedy supply of our, um, you know, Amendment Act 2014 um, for another four years came about until 2018. So that was approved and the cabinet secretary explained to um, the whole country that the implementation of the law has proved very fruitful as it was not possible to meet the countrywide growing demand of power and energy under the traditional procurement laws and rules. Then, when we came to 2008 and it looked as if it would have run its course, in July itself, the cabinet and later the Bangladesh parliament uh, approved a further extension of the Act of 2010 for another three years. So again, the cabinet secretary briefed us, the cabinet has approved the draft power and energy special provision amendment bill 2018, extending the effectiveness of the law until October 2021. So we are in the midst um, where it is still in force. The power and energy ministry had sought further extension of that special provision act in which indemnified officials concerned against prosecution for awarding contracts without tender until 2021. Parliament also passed the bill that sought the amendment as the construction of power plants for ensuring quick supply of power and energy in the country are yet to be completed, we were told. And so, um, Barrister Jyotimai Barua, since you are really, you are like a walking bridge school, um, you and your colleagues at SOPL, um, where you can bridge activists like us and uh, lawyers and the understanding of laws. So could you tell us more about uh, this act, which has been uh, you know, extended time and again by the government and why? Thank you, Vidya. You have given a really vivid um, picture of the background of the law and what sort of role it is basically playing. Um, I'm not going to go into those background details any further because uh, whatever you explained is basically clear enough um, to understand what is happening. And uh, I'm just going to take you through um, certain provisions of the law to give you a better understanding of the wording they use in the actual law. I have shared the English version of the law with Mehdi, um, you can get access to that particular English version of the law from him if you um, are interested in. I'm just going to give you a, 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 the preamble of the law gives certain background, a small paragraph if you allow me to read it. It is an act to make special provisions for facilitating 
effective and urgent matter to enhance the generation transmission transportation and marketing of electricity and energy with a view to ensuring an interrupted supply of electricity and energy keeping pace with the demands of agricultural industrial commercial and domestic activity and for quick implementation of the plan to import electricity and energy from abroad if necessary and for implementation of the decision on urgent extraction and utilization of minerals related to energy that is that is the law says in the preamble that why they are enacting this law in 2010 as you know we had our um, energy master plan in 2010 as part of that uh, master plan they have enacted this law um a section i'm going to go through only four to five sections very quickly um on uh, section 3 of the act it says uh, the non obstante clause you know the overriding principle of the law that uh, this present law shall prevail over any other previous law it says it's very interesting what they said in this particular section because if you consider other laws most of the laws have this non obstante clause but this non obstante clause is very much peculiar to us look at the uh, wording of it not withstanding anything contained in the public procurement act 2006 act number 26 of 2006 or any other law for the time being in force the provisions of this act shall prevail why they had to mention this public procurement act 2006 this particular act of 2006 basically ensures certain transparency of public procurement process so they had to publish open tenders allow the bidders to participate and then in an open process they have to finalize the procurement um, process of the government this is how it is done and we have a particular in 2008 they have enacted the rules for this act 2006 act public procurement act now they are saying whatever is in that public procurement act they don't need to follow it they can bypass it for the sake of this quick enhancement law <coughs> sorry then uh, at section 4 undertaking plans and accepting proposals if you again look into the wording of the section it says the government and all enterprises owned or controlled by the government may undertake any plan under this act for quick enactment enhancement of the generation transmission transportation and marketing of electricity or energy or may accept any proposal look at the wording any proposal for undertaking any plan regarding import of electricity or energy from abroad and transmission transportation and marketing thereof and quick implementation of the same look if you look into the wording of the sentence making the wording of the uh, particular section that there is no check and balance they are not they are basically waiving all those options <coughs> you cannot question them why they have taken up this plan because they said any the word any quote on quote any they can take up any proposal from anyone from any organization either to implement all these plans locally or to import electricity from abroad this is how all these uh, advises to the, to the prime minister advised her to import electricity and pay this high amount of cap electricity charges and uh, <coughs> popularly we call it in our country the quick rental charges so this this is these are the provisions of how the government um, it wasted our money by for the quick rentals because of these this particular section because no one can question them and they have this unfettered authority to accept any proposal under section 4 then um, if i come to section 5 it says proposal processing committee and its terms of reference they have created a pro- proposal processing committee this proposal processing committee can do or undo anything according to this particular section they are not accountable to anyone <coughs> sorry they can take up any proposal again any the word i am emphasizing they can take up any proposal plan for carrying out the purpose of this act and then uh, 
keeping consistent with the technical um, liabilities, technical um, aspects of the case, the government shall form this uh, proposal processing committee. Then what they do, this proposal processing committee basically finalizes the process, uh, pro proposals to some extent and then forward it to the cabinet for their final approval. In the, Ministry of, in the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources, they basically do nothing other than just giving approval. This is, this is what it happens basically. It sounds like they have the uh, final authority to give approval to a proposal, but in fact, this proposal processing committee is doing the main job. Then the uh, co cabinet uh, members, they are just giving uh, some paper approvals of the uh, proposals. Uh, in fact, then if I come to um, uh, section, subsection 2 of section 5, this is quite important. I'm just going to read the wording. For the purpose of implementing the plan, the processing committee shall communicate, consult, and bargain with any organization. Again, the word any. Any organization concerned to the the competency, experience, and financial capability of such organizations prepare a proposal containing such recommendations as may serve the best of the public interest. <coughs> now, this is again the word public interest is mentioned here. Uh, it is very peculiar in our country. The, this, this public interest concept is always overriding with each other, always um, overlapping basically with each other. This is uh, the way they, form form they formatted the language of the section really carefully. We have uh, earlier and uh, the, the uh, of those new are no reason consider their interest carefully instead of the interest. <coughs> Now, section section the publication proposal. When purchase or investment proposal is placed under the very small one, I'm going to read out the section nine, which is basically created this immunity because our emphasis today is on the immunity of the energy sector in Bangladesh. Section nine says bar to jurisdiction of court, etc. No question regarding the validity of any act, the word any again, any act done or purported to be done, any action taken or any order issued or direction given under this act shall be raised in any court. But this law has been enacted in 2010. Then subsequently it has gone through certain amendments <coughs> Sorry, until 2018. But we have number of decisions um, in the Supreme Court of Bangladesh. Um, especially, I'm going to recall one uh, which is basically popularly known as Eighth Amendment Judgment of the Supreme Court, Constitution's Eighth Amendment Judgment of, of the Supreme Court, wherein the Supreme Court um, very clearly held that no law can limit the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh. That was in 1988, and the judgment was pronounced in 1989. And then in 2010, we are having a law again, curtailing or excluding the jurisdiction of the court, that you cannot challenge the action of this um, under this act, taken or uh, any order issued or given under this act by any authority or the so-called uh, proposal processing committee or the cabinet or the financial committee. So this is against our um, law because the law I am saying because according to our article 111 of the constitution, whatever um, decision is pronounced by the Supreme Court of Bangladesh becomes law. So that is the understanding of law, the sources of law as well. So now if I come to uh, section 10, that is another problematic area which basically allowed these people, these organizations, to play as as they wish. Um, section 10 raised um, protection for protection of action taken in good faith. No suit or prosecution 
or any other legal proceeding shall lie against any officer or employee for anything which is in good faith done or purported to be done at the time of discharging his duties under this act or rules made and general or special order passed there under so this good faith thing good faith principle if you consider this good faith principle for the criminal proceedings then <coughs> sorry then there are certain conditions you need to fulfill uh, according to the uh, bangladesh penal code 1860 there are certain conditions you need to fulfill to take this um, safeguard of good faith but for civil actions the area is still gray and they are taking um, the benefit of this section altogether with section 9 which bars the jurisdiction of the court because we are we are unable to challenge this but having said that there are precedents of challenging this immunity or indemnity in the court and successfully done by this present government basically the first one i should mention is the indemnity ordinance of 1975 which basically indemnified the killers of the father of the nation in 19 1996 the awamili led government they have repealed the law which paved the way for holding trial against those killers of the father of the nation and if i can uh, cite certain cases uh, like shariar uh, mr shariar and uh, bazur rashid all these people the present law minister was one of the law- lawyers in the team he has argued in the supreme court that there are certain things uh, from the um, from the defense side are good in the court that according to section 6 of the general clause of act if, uh, if a particular law is repealed then all the privileges allowed or recorded under the earlier law <coughs> does not cease to exist the people still enjoys those rights <coughs> the I, sorry the high court division as well as the appellate division has that no that is not the position and uh, the uh, present law minister who was a pa- part of that lawyer team at the time he he successfully argued that no that is not the that is not the case section 6 of the general clause act does not really apply in this case and uh, um, they are they are liable for their actions and similar actions we have seen in um in the uh, eighth amendment case uh, supreme court categorically um, uh, defined the position of the bangladesh jurisdiction on this particular point and again in uh, 2016 we had this joint dry indemnity bill which has been enacted by the then bnp led government they uh, had a joint operation uh, where they have killed at least about uh, 57 people who were told to be died out of heart attack basically killed in the action against terrorism and uh, a large number of people were injured over 12000 people were in prison at that time <coughs> during 2002 and 2003 and the high court division again um, in 2016 um, it was basically order was, judgment was pronounced in 2015 but uh, it was uh, finally published in 2016 it again clearly holds that no the action of the um, joint team who has carried out this uh, killing at that relevant time 2002 and 2003 cannot be indemnified because this is against the uh, provisions of article 46 of the constitution article 46 um, is a special provision and it should be uh, used as far english that is the main uh, crust of the judgment of uh, 2016 judge so um, if we consider this um, uh, quick enhancement of uh, power and energy uh, supply special provisions act 2010 we can also challenge this because the present government um, uh, initially took the step to uh, repeal the indemnity act of 1975 so they cannot argue otherwise at this uh, moment and uh, this is what we are seeing like 
because of these earlier precedents i have mentioned there are number of cases we can um we can successfully challenge this i hope so and uh, with the bangladesh working group and uh, um this uh, school of uh, people's law we are working together on this and uh, hopefully with the help of all other friends so uh, together we can challenge this in the court and i can see light uh, it's not like on the uh, dark on the end of the tunnel i can see light uh, if we work really hard if we press it really hard if the normal court uh, situation uh, resumes to work again uh, like before we can uh, hopefully challenge this in the court so i'll <coughs> i'll rest my initial <coughs> response here I'll, i'll be happy to answer any questions later on thank you barrister <laughs> um really uh, we must sort of acknowledge the kind of untiring communication effort he has put in because he is recovering from a respiratory distress um, uh, you know um, uh, a bout of respiratory distress um, as is our next speaker and while um, barrister borua has given us the sections and then sort of connected it so uh, beautifully by mentioning cases that we have read in the newspaper that has an emotional connect to us and therefore we can see that this is really doable uh, in the true spirit of um, uh, you know uh, the school of people's law um the other person who has also just recovered from respiratory distress is really the ultimate voice of bangladesh on environmental law uh, she is a star advocate in the supreme court of bangladesh and we are very happy to welcome her onto our um, seminar today uh, she has been working as the chief executive of bangladesh environmental lawyers association bela her work Uh, was recognized and uh, she was awarded the goldman environmental prize in 2009 as also the raman magsaysay award in 2012 for her uncompromising courage and impassioned leadership in a campaign of judicial activism in bangladesh that affirms the people's right to a good environment as nothing less than their right to dignity and life this is what the award read as her organization bela has received several international awards including most recently the tang prize 2020 in the category rule of law we are very proud and extremely fortunate um that advocate saida rizwana hasan is with us ma'am the floor is yours thank you very much vidya uh in bangladesh we actually uh, call people apa or call them by name to uh, give them a level of comfort if you call me madam i'll feel as if i'm elevated to a level from which i'll not be able to communicate with you you are elevated but you are still our apa yes <laughs> call me by name I, i'm known as rizwana see i didn't know it's going to be such a uh you know organized uh, discussion so i haven't really prepared anything i've just got my pen here and my diary i've just uh, noted down a few things i don't know if you really want to get into a very legal discussion on this because i agree with whatever uh, jyotirmoy has said about making the government and the corporation accountable but there is a political dimension to it i would like to tell you that we are living in an era now in bangladesh in a particular phase in bangladesh where our democracy has been very badly defeated you can still think of people's protest in india but i don't think we can think of um, a mass gathering of 200 people protesting against a power plant if we do yes there have been incidents so there was an incidents back in 2004 i don't remember the exact year where people of a given uh, area of bangladesh protested against the government's plan to go for open mining of coal and the protest was so powerful that the government from dhaka had to send special envoy to that local area pacify people tell them that no we are not going to go for open pit mining 
and they had to sign an agreement. It was so forceful that even after so many years, the government hasn't been able to finalize its coal policy because it wants to finalize the coal policy, but it wants to keep provision for export there. It wants to keep provision of open pit mining in it. And that is just not becoming possible because of what the government faced there. But then 10 years, 12 years down the road, when people protest against having coal-based power plant in, in a place very close to Shundarbans, and a project that is posing definite risks to the uh, largest mangrove forest of the world, the government has shown the strength. You know, a professor of the university, Professor Anu Muhammad, who is basically leading the um, campaigns, he was brutally beaten up by the police to an extent that his legs were broken. He had to be hospitalized. And the next day, we saw the ministers going to see him. So you see, if you want to consider or kind of capture the entire governance picture here in Bangladesh, it's actually very clumsy. There is no particular rhythm or particular tone that it's following. So one day your police is beating him up. What would Professor Anu Muhammad do? Does he have the ability to set fire in a public transportation? I mean, do we, do we see him as a person of... Uh, that kind of an attitude, does the government believe that he would actually be causing deterioration of law and order? His whole plan was to go to the, to have a march towards the energy ministry and hand over some memorandum. I don't think, Jyotimoy, that with the finest advocates of the country and with the weakest of the law that we have in hand, and the constitutional spirit that we all believe in, if we go to the court, it will be any easy for us anymore. I don't think so. We have, not us, but other groups have, their, have tried their luck with the Rampal power plant. And Rampal power plant is criticized not only by people like Anu Muhammad or you and me, it has been criticized by UNESCO. The government, on the face of UNESCO uh, criticism, has said that they are abandoning the second phase of the Rampal power plant, but they're sticking to the first one because the government thinks it will be a political defeat for them again. After the Asia energy defeat in Dinajpur, if they accept this defeat, they'll never be able to you know, implement any coal-based plant. So they, there are other political dimensions. to it. It's not only a Bangladesh project, it's a Bangladesh-India project. So when the negotiation takes place in UNESCO, it's not only Bangladesh throwing its political weightage, it is also India coming in. It's also China coming in because China has interest in another coal-based power plant nearby and they'll be using the same river route. It is the Bangladesh-India-China political power that is not allowing the political decision-making platform of UNESCO to say no to it. But the scientific platform of it led by IUCN, has already said no to it. So you see, I don't think we will have much luck in the high court nowadays if you, if you want to challenge the, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the propositions of the government of, in, of Bangladesh in the coal policy about developing the ability of the national sector in, in dealing with coal. Uh, or about the, the, the proposal of the government to still export the coal when the national demand will, also, will not be met. I mean, if you, if you take a long-term scenario, the coal that we have in hand, if we extract all of it, that will not uh, you know, meet our demand after a given uh, phase. And now you have the whole climate debate in the scene, whether to uh, at all ask for capacity building of the national institutions for, for coal or to say completely no to coal and switch to renewable for which Bangladesh has excellent prospect. So coming back to the, to the whole issue of, so, so you, can't, you, can't, uh, we, you can't really separate the energy immunity from the total governance picture, from the entire uh, picture of democracy. When you don't have a government which is, uh, I mean, in all respect, elected. Yes, yes, there was an election. I don't deny that. But there were hardly any voters. And a very um, minimum um, percentage of voters' uh, votes have been counted. I mean, these are all public documents. Asking for accountability for that sort of a government, 
is an extra challenge. When your democracy functions, even, even the weakest form of democracy uh, has some empowering element for the people, for civil society movements. But uh, with this form of a democracy, it's extra challenging. And, and where you have an opposition which is totally a domesticated opposition, and the actual opposition has been silenced, and journalists are being arrested after two and a half months. Well, previously you would find their uh, dead bodies floating in the rivers. Now you don't see that anymore. What you see is the journalist has been released after, has, has come out from somewhere. I can't say has been released officially, has come out from somewhere. And then the uh, law enforcing agency is filing case against him for failing to produce passport on demand. I mean, do, you, do we all move around in our own countries with passports in hand? And, and the social media, the way it's being um, observed and monitored by the government. So that's the overall governance scenario. When we talk about coal or gas or electricity, I think in all sectors, we have created precedents about how to give immunity to these players. I mean, ADB and World Bank can give you prescriptions, but if your own policies are not properly designed, um, then there is hardly any scope for the civil society actors to reap benefit and question ADB and World Bank. So who do you question first, ADB World Bank, or you question your government first? If I want to question my government first, I do not know how things are happening here in Bangladesh. There was a Canadian company. I told you that we have as many as 10 versions of draft coal policy. Not a single one has been finalized, but we have moved from one coal project to 29 coal projects without a policy in hand. Come to gas now. A Canadian company came to Bangladesh, wanted to work on our abundant and marginalized gas field. They got a contract. Um, they set fire in one given gas field twice. So we, we took a case to the High Court Division saying that this, this company has to compensate. And this agreement has to be declared void and void of initio because it was actually uh, executed by misuse of power. The court said the contract is legal. Why is it legal? Because successive prime ministers have endorsed. One endorsed the policy and the other one endorsed the agreement. So if the prime ministers endorse, it can't be wrong. How it, only these three lines against our 2000 page petition. And then, so it was legal, but the company has to pay compensation. Then the company went to ICSID. So you now have, it's not only Bangladesh judiciary, you have platforms like ICSID. So they went to the international tribunal. There the government of Bangladesh lost. And the government of Bangladesh was directed to pay back all the dues of the gas company. I would rather stop here. I would just tell you that we don't have clear policies here in Bangladesh. Whatever we have are administrative decisions. They are heavily biased and in, in much in favor of the companies. And they're often taken without consultation with the people. We don't have a very elaborate EIA system, EIA regime in Bangladesh. Land is first acquired and then EIA is done, which is not the case in India. So one, once you acquire the land, investing so much of money, you can't expect the government to backtrack and say that the acquisition was actually wrong. We are giving people back their land. The law won't permit it. We finally, we had an incident in 2015 where local people protested against the coal project. The police and army opened fire. Seven people died. Uh, but then the, the uh, owner of the, the proponent is so powerful, so powerful, so powerful that the Navy was probably deployed, either Navy or Air Force, I don't remember. So they then started dealing with the land acquisition process. You know, when, the, when they started with it, nobody even dared to say that we are not getting enough compensation. So all the voices were suppressed and there was no, no legal case uh, in favor of the government. In, in favor of the people. So this is where we uh, stand today. Every time you're, you're being presented with the coal, saying that it's cheap, it's not actually cheap because nobody takes into consideration the environmental and social cost of it. Okay, and I don't think we have institutions in hand where we can go and challenge decisions that are not economic, that are not because of energy, but because of financial interest of the government people. We don't have an institution that would actually accept and would dare nowadays to say no to those uh, projects. That's what my feeling is. Thank you.
Thank you, Appa. That was wonderful. You brought us from the, the law books that Jyotirmai had opened up to us to really bang on on the ground. And um, I think uh, it was very, very telling that, um, I mean, while Bangladesh might be a very stark example of what is happening, uh, I think your neighbor India is also pretty much the same nowadays. Land is still picked up even before an EIA is done and projects therefore push through and, you know, de facto come into being. Um, also, our EIA uh, notification is being watered down during COVID times. So COVID times is um, a time that the government and others think that they can do just about anything uh, where people cannot protest. Protesting, she has reminded us, is very difficult in Bangladesh today. Um, we don't know which way they will go, but she's also given us some clues like going to international bodies and courts and also some resistance from the ground and how a political situation or a political flare-up can all come together nicely to push the government or the powers that be uh, to be more responsive to people's concerns. Uh, somebody was talking, oh, I think APA talked of many other fossil fuel industries um, that are coming up all over Bangladesh and how uh, many projects are Indo-Bangla. Um, towards this, the Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt and my group in SAF are um, going to have on the 20th, of this month, and I hope you all will join us, including you, APA, um, where we will look at three specific projects that, in a way, are cross boundary projects. One is Ramphal, of course, uh, then is the Adani power plant in Goda in India, uh, where all the power is supposed to come to you in Bangladesh, and the third, of course, is the Meghna Ghat um, 750 megawatt uh, plant, which which is um, owned by Reliance. And of course, there's Chinese uh, also all over. But for now, we'll have an Indo-Bangla um, dialogue on, um, on uh, this on the 20th evening. So please do join us. Let me now introduce our next speaker. Dr. Kazi Zahid uh, Iqbal is one of the prominent lawyers, again, in the Supreme Court of Bangladesh. He's also one of the panel lawyers of Bangladesh Legal Aid Services Trust, called BLAST. Um, Ex-Vice Chairperson of Bangladesh Women Health Coalition and the member of Bangladesh History Society. I think all of this really makes for a well-rounded experience that he can bring to us. Uh, and we're very, very happy to welcome him. He has a number of publications on legal issues in Bangladesh. Um, please, Dr. Kazi Zahid Iqbal, um, the mic is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, Vidya, uh, Vidya Dinkar, the moderator. And my heartfelt congratulations to Jyotirmoy Borua, my colleague in the High Court. Uh, for his nice presentation and definitely my respect to Sri Adariz and Hassan Appa uh, for one of our iconic uh, 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 activists in uh, various issues and my gratitude to the School of People's Law and Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt for their arrangement of this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you all of you for having patience. Uh, and let me go to the book again uh, after the very fascinating presentation by Rizwan Apa. Uh, let me see the book again. Uh, there is a uh, proposition that uh, energy law have three dimensions. First is, uh, energy, energy uh, policy, and energy security. The second is economic issue, and third is environmental issue. But uh, it, always we see the law, policy, and economic issues always uh, get privileged over the environmental issues. To enhance the energy security and economy, the law uh, takes its position in favor of the energy-related uh, technology instead of 
uh, environment. In Bangladesh, there is a uh, culture of, uh, in Bangladesh, there is an uh, energy policy which has been uh, revised and changed time to time. The policy is not and uh, environment fun, uh, en environmental fun, uh, environment friendly in a strict sense. Moreover, quick enhancement of electricity and energy supply act 2010, as uh, Jyotirmay mentioned and elaborately explained, has made room for unfair practice by incorporating immunity clause in it, if anyone want to do so. We can see section nine and 10 uh, for instance. In section nine and 10, there is an immunity if an, uh, 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 immunity in the law that no one can challenge any action of the committee before any court. The, uh, uh, we can uh, mention here that the uh, immunity culture is not new in Bangladesh. Constitution also made room for it Article 46, in, for instance, we can see that uh, the room for immunity in, uh, has been uh, mentioned in the Constitution. But in practical aspects, corruption is not at all immune under the Act. There are also instances of strike down the immunity by the Code, as mentioned by the Dothirmai Bodu already. So still there is a scope to challenge the immunity if there is any allegation uh, to the uh, of corruption uh, in the process. Any kind of immunity clause in any law is a violation of fundamental principle of the constitutional spirit. I have the opinion that immunity, the, uh, that the, there is always a scope for challenge any law containing any section ultraviolet to the constitutional spirit. Every stakeholder should keep an eye on, on, the, uh, law, uh, on such type of law. Uh, and now, finally, I, I can mention about the quick rental issue. It is unbelievable, its unbelievable uh, expenditure should be redressed by the authority concerned because it is bad in it creates bad instances for the image of the country uh, actually uh, jyotil moy has already mentioned all the things and uh, subsequently apa uh, already uh, elaborately explained from the uh, political perspective uh, leaving a little room for me to uh, say more something, um, uh, add more something uh, about the law. I just want to mention here that if we want to challenge the immunity related issues before the court, still there is room. And if we together uh, create the situation that we can challenge it in the court, we can do it. Uh, that's all of, uh, from my part at this moment. And if there is any question, uh, I will answer it. Thank you all. Thank you. There are going to be questions and they've already come up. So we'll go directly into that so that we can actually um, have a good discussion. Uh, Jyotirmai, I hope you have your hot water handy there. I'll put the question first to you, Jyotirmai. Um, Munira Choudhury from Market Forces asks, for most of the proposed and under construction power plants, we see a 50-50 ownership split between Bangladesh and foreign countries. However, there are exceptions like the Barisal coal plant, which has only 4% ownership by Bangladeshi, by a Bangladeshi company and 96% foreign ownership. Is there a law or provisions to what percentage ownership a, follow, a foreign corporation can have in a power plant in Bangladesh? That is a specific question. Would you take it up, Barrister? Yes, sure. Uh, 
there is no such law basic uh, in in place in our country at the moment um, as i mentioned earlier in our 2010 law it allows you to quote unquote the word any any proposal that gives you the wide area unfettered power to decide whatever you want and <clears throat> the other thing i should mention here is if you look into our constitution there are certain characteristics of our constitution and full of contradictions though as a practitioner i am supposed to uphold this constitution all the time respect show some sort of respect all the time but when when i am uh, criticizing the laws or doing some sort of research i i find it quite quite dubious sometimes that it does not give you adequate protection other than creating obstacles to ensure uh, public rights say for example <clears throat> if you look into article 82 of article 2 of the constitution part 2 of the constitution basically have all the state fundamental state policies uh, in 2015 uh, 2011 through 15th amendment they have been, uh, they have taken up uh, protection for the environment uh, article 18 as well so there are certain uh, fundamental state policy which would uh, sound like okay this these are the things which basically give to you the protection but when you go back to the 8th sub article 2 then it says these are the fundamental state principles state should follow but even if they don't follow it you cannot challenge it in the court or you cannot enforce it through the court that means these fundamental policies gives the government a really long way forward to do whatever they want now the implication of this in reality is that whenever government takes up the policy that if that policy is inconsistent with the part 2 of the constitution you cannot enforce it because of this article 82 of the constitution so if the government decides that bangladesh government will have only 4% ownership and rest of the 96% will be given away to the foreign companies you cannot challenge it obviously because of the bar we have but having said that this is really uh, not very pleasant to say having said that the court occasionally um ignores this article 82 when it comes to protect their interests in in a case of separation of judiciary in 2006 in a, uh, the famous mustar husain case they have overlooked this article 82 that is the only instance i can remember of overlooking this act otherwise whenever you try to challenge other uh, state policies or their their policy Uh, that this is inconsistent with the policies mentioned in part two of the constitution. The court will uh, take their hands off and say, "No, no, no, you cannot challenge this in the court. Government has the ultimate authority to take up any policy." So th- these are the sort of frustrations. I was about to um, uh, give the feedback after what Rizwan Ahmed said. Um, I am basically uh, good for uh, frustrating people, but because of this coughing, I was frustrated. So I thought. I should give it a, a positive approach today, but Rizwan Appa took my <laughs> position very strongly. Though I'm not saying that Rizwan Appa uh, says otherwise all the time, but she took exactly the same position I usually take. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Barrister. And um, I think it's uh, wonderful that everyone has so much energy to try and change things. Uh, there are a lot of questions that are coming up. um i think um because there was a specific question that was to follow um, uh, the previous i will ask that yes donna mari linsby asked to add to munira's excellent question regarding the ownership of borisal uh, i would like to ask if anyone has seen any eis um that's an environmental uh, social impact statement or an eis study published for borisal um does anyone have the answer uh, among the three of you or even mehdi um from the bangladesh working group can answer okay uh, rizwana pa maybe uh, uh, focus more on that because bela uh, already uh, submitted a petition to get a eia report of a power project and uh, the the ministry <laughs> said that yeah and they said that uh, we can we can't give you the um, uh, eia report because you can use it for subversive activities for the state 
uh, we we tried to get uh, ESI report of Barishal power plant, which is Isotec and uh, Power China, it's a consortium, where Isotec is only four owner of only four percent. But we, we we couldn't find it till now. We are trying, uh, and uh, uh, I don't know what should be answered. Uh, what is the future? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, uh, Vidya, another. Vidya, the, can I answer okay. that? Yes, yes, please, please add to it. Uh, like, uh, Bangladesh Center for Advanced Studies has done the uh, environmental and social impact report for the summit Barisal for project in 2016. If somebody is interested, I can share a copy of that. Uh, I think sorry, somewhere sorry, uh, in my, my, uh, I'm, I'm telling in the middle. Uh, we already have that. That is that is the that is the you know uh, 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 power based power plant. It's called heavy fuel oil based. It's not Borishal coal power plant. So uh, Borishal coal power plant is totally different. It's Isotec and uh, and Power China is the owner. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, we'll go on to the next question, which is to um, uh, Apa Rizwana from Noor Alam Sheikh of Bapa. The cost of electricity generated from renewable energy sources such as solar and wind is now reducing by 13% every year. So can the Bangladesh government turn the Sundarbans destructive Rampal power station into a renewable power plant if it wants to at the moment i i would not really ask the question like this because i don't think converting a coal based power plant into a renewable will solve the problem so far sundarbans is is concerned we have to ensure that at least 20 kilometers area around the forest is uh, kept free from all sorts of economic activities. I mean, it's 10 kilometers now as per Bangladeshi law, but for Shundabon, they have to make an exception and make it 20 kilometer because we shared this Shundabans with India. And if it was something that we wanted to get done in India, India would never allow it because there the buffer zone or the protected zone is 20 kilometers. So we should ask for uh, stopping all sorts of economic ventures, however benign the government may like to, uh, you know, portray those as prohibited in that area. Okay, so we should not ask for that. But the question, I, if I uh, would ask it, I would ask it differently, saying that whether the government of Bangladesh should consider switching to a more aggressive uh, solar power generation, then investing in all these twenty nine coal-based power plants and to that my answer would definitely be yes. However, there are challenges to solar. You need space for the panel. Uh, how you manage the battery end of the day is also an issue. So there are challenges that come with solar also. So the government should be investing there because after a given uh, period of time, you will not get coal in the world. You will also not get gas in the world. You have to switch to something that's going to be there for you. So we should push for more solar power projects, but we should also invest in research so that the production system, um, the, the panel challenges, the space challenges can also be met. Thank you, Apa. We must also push all the sunset industries off um, our lands. Uh, there's a legal question coming from Donna Marie Linsby again. Uh, are there other laws in Bangladesh that could supersede the Speedy Power Supply Act and its preemption clause? Or are there recent high court rulings that elevate protections of people or the environment over power plant siting and construction? For example, the laws and recent high court rulings in Bangladesh regarding protection of rivers and water. Could the water law or decision trump the Speedy Power Supply Act if the right case was brought in the right court before the right judge. So many clauses there, uh, but I guess with our present legal system, they are also warranted. So um, uh, any three of you, or could I ask uh, our last speaker 
to first speak on this and then the other two speakers can also jump in. Uh, 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 thank you, uh, Donna, for your question. Uh, yes, I do agree with you. Uh, there are so many clauses that they are right judge, right court, <laughs> and right time. Uh, actually, uh, Rizwan Apa already mentioned here that uh, uh, we are passing a difficult time uh, for activism. Uh, and that's why the right things need to be considered. Uh, and this, at this point, my opinion is uh, we can go for uh, a uh, go for the go for uh, to declare ultraviolence the law because uh, the immunity clause is actually against the principle of the constitution because uh, no one is immune from uh, doing any corruption. So um, uh, we can consider for a suit or uh, for a writ. To, uh, uh, do, to, to, to strike down the uh, clause from the law. And, uh, and uh, I have already said here that we have a culture of immunity uh, in this country and our constitution also make room for the immunity uh, under the article 46 of the constitution. So there is a culture of immunity, though there is a culture of immunity, but uh, uh, we can challenge this law uh, uh, in an appropriate bench, uh, in an appropriate before a, an appropriate judge uh, for a strike down it because it is against the principle of the constitution. Let me share my um, experience here, um, having uh, having keeping in mind about what Rizwanapa said earlier about the whole. System or, the, or the environment <coughs> relating to democracy in the country. Even, um, even we have all these uh, shortcomings and the limitations of the law, I have taken up uh, two different approaches uh, when uh, coming to challenge this power plant project um, in the court. I have already challenged one to um, and you hear recently I have challenged one in the Pyra. The Pyra people, they, they, came, they came up to me on a completely different aspect. I, I did not challenge the construction of the power plant. I challenged uh, with the guise of another law that the acquisition of their land, the process the uh, local administration followed was strong. They have not been uh, given enough um, chance to raised their complaint against this acquisition of land. And uh, there are plenty of other lands uh, surrounding the area so they could leave their homesteads instead of taking their homesteads, they can utilize other barren lands or the plain lands they can have. But in Paira area, if you look into the area, in three particular um, sub-districts, government, uh, including the local uh, companies and foreign companies, they have acquired 50% of the total land in the sub-districts. 50% of the total land. If you consider the word when, when and how the government authorities can acquire land of a private person, the quote-unquote qualification is public interest. What is the public interest in here? when you are acquiring land, 50% of the total land in a particular area. So there is no um, uh, public interest point here. So then I challenge that your process of acquiring this land is not correct. That's how I have prevented them from taking over the land up to up until now. But taking the advantage of this COVID situation, the local authorities are issuing letters to some vague persons, to fake persons, to collect the compensation from them. This is another game we are playing in Matarbari, in, in Bashkali, and in all other uh, projects, mega projects, including power plants or even other projects, that the people who are getting compensation are not really the affected person. And the people close to the ruling party and uh, the local administration, they are getting, they are making money out of from this compensation uh, which is being given by the requiring body or requiring organization and uh, 
this land issue, this environment issue we have, uh, we have sought in uh, environment preservation laws in 1995 and many other laws to protect them. The donor rightly said we have the river protection laws, but we have to play very smartly um, to try at least instead of just uh, holding our hands, uh, thinking that, okay, nothing gonna happen. So we sometimes try with this sort of uh, other laws, instead of just saying that, no, you cannot construct this power plant here. Instead of uh, doing that, we try to hit with different different laws um, to stop them from continuing their power plant project. The second uh, policy is, whenever you see the local people are protesting, if you consider the open um, coal power <coughs> project in Fulbury, the local people, and in many other cases, in, in a tea state problem we've seen in 2015, when local people are organized, you should not take those matters to the court because of what Rizona said. The court can destroy your local movement sometimes because that can be manipulated. That can be um, the, that can be manipulated whatever the authorities want. Uh, I cannot say uh, more than this in, in, in this public forum. Uh, I have only one skin and uh, one heart beating. Uh, uh, it will be quite difficult if I go on more clear explanation on this particular point. But if you see the movement and local people are involved in the, in the movement against some uh, particular project, that we should not go to the court. This is another second principle I always follow. <coughs> Thank you. That's an important thing that all of us need to keep in mind, I think. When there is a strong movement on the ground, don't knock the, um, the court's door. Uh, unless there's no other option. Um, Rizwana Appa, do you want to um, add on to that? Or there is another question that I can put to you? I or actually, the person who asked the question can put it to you directly. Joyce Tan of Client Earth, do you want to put your question directly to uh, Rizwana Appa? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you so much for those very interesting interventions. I was just wondering if uh, it would be possible to use other laws, and I realize that this is very similar to what Donna asked earlier, uh, to, to be able to indirectly challenge a proposed plant without violating the, the provision in the Speedy Supply Act against court jurisdiction. And second, I was wondering if there have been attempts to question the constitutionality of the law itself uh, since it has been passed in 2010 and in the various extensions that it has had. Thank you. So to answer the first question, uh, whether we can perhaps challenge the a given project or a particular law before the right case, with the right case, before the right judge uh, in the right court. Yes, we can, but one more right has to be added and that is right time. Uh, because it's politically very, um, I mean, it's, it's controlled politically, it's dominated, the whole system is dominated by politics. You should rather wait for the right time to come. And meanwhile, you, don't, you just don't sit idle. You do your own work, keep on writing in the media, uh, keep on having meetings, discussions like this, so that the conscious of the people, the conscious of the society, and the conscious of the institutions um, are also, you know, kept alive. Because there are many good judges in the in the in the system that we have in Bangladesh, but whether it's the right time for them to say the thing that they want to say, or that that should be said in light with the law, remains a big question. We just had a very contentious case, very, sen I mean, it was huge sensation in Bangladesh when they found antibiotic in baby products, like some in milk. So one judge asked for reports uh, from government agencies. They gave reports and all the reports actually said that the farm that, the farms that are producing these milks are using antibiotic for feeding the animals. And that's why they're getting the antibiotic in the milk. 
and the judge came up with a very good decision a very good order but the judge next day his bench was changed you know his power was changed so uh, you know it probably takes a lot of guts nowadays for the judges more than litigants like us but you can always challenge the constitutionality of this uh, act and you could always challenge the projects on environmental grounds but i just want to clarify my um, point again and with another example if time permits it is about the rampal power plant where local people went to the court uh, and the court actually gave an injunction order against acquisition of land but then it was a time when probably monmohan singh was coming to bangladesh i don't remember i think it was monmohan singh no because narendra modi i don't remember making it to bangladesh so so monmohan singh when was coming to bangladesh so the attorney general of bangladesh went before the court and he said my lord um, the, the the prime minister of uh, india is coming so we have to get this injunction vacated otherwise we can't get the agreement signed and then the injunction did not continue anymore so what was a legal fight turned out to be a political battle and then the neither neither the parties pressed for extension of uh, the injunction after monmohan singh ji left bangladesh nor was there any move from any quarter to ensure that the project is stopped so this is how things happen and how things are happening here yeah, we have many glaring examples of um, orders coming from indian supreme court uh the national green tribunal and from other parts of the world like netherlands and everywhere where there are climate litigations being filed and our courts there are benches who are really willing to take up the issue but the thing is whether you i mean as i say that foreign donation act the media act the the act that regulates uh, you know your opinion in the social media with all that will totally silence you and do you really want to brave that or you want to keep the issue alive the discussion alive and just hit it at the right time so we probably have to and, and whether the right time comes on comes on its own or you actually create that momentum i think we are in the process of creating the momentum but we still have to wait thanks so creating the momentum and keep going until everything falls in place and you get the, you get what you want um donna and joyce um uh, if you are okay with that then we can go oh yes joyce says thank you very much and donna uh, from river fox also if you have something more to say yes thank you um there is a question that i see from monover da monover mustafa would you uh, like to ask your question yourself you can simply read out <clears throat> yes it's very simple question to is on our part yes. you can simply read out okay so um, um monover is now with the european climate fund um, uh, you know this is for the benefit of um, the speakers today would you give us an update about the clean air act that you drafted last year and this is for rizwana appa and as i can recall my memory you had a good discussion on the draft with a good number of concerned policy makers so we want to be updated about that the draft has been submitted to the department of environment and the ministry of environment and forest did a real big operation on it the progressive provisions that we kept there some of those have been deleted so we had a meeting with the parliamentary standing committee and the parliamentary standing committee has requested the ministry to uh, bring those points back so we have resubmitted a revised version which is now lying with the department of environment and the ministry of environment and forest but covid has done it for us you know part of it has been done by covid air has been cleaned and this is for the first time in last 10 years that the air quality in bangladesh has uh, been uh, assessed as satisfactory it was always critical or extremely dangerous this time it has come out to be satisfactory so we can actually breathe uh, in covid times in dhaka city that's wonderful uh, azad minus covid <laughs> Yes, yes. Rizwana and Jyotirmay have had trouble breathing uh, during this time, so they will understand. Um, I think Azad Bhai from Action Aid, why don't you ask your question here?
Hello, do you hear me? Uh, my question is simple. I think uh, the law, uh, quick uh, enhancement of electricity and energy supply at 2010, and the basis of the law is to increase power supply in our country because of the shortage of power. But in this COVID time, power demand actually uh, drastically uh, fall down, drastically decreased. So I think this is the time to challenge the law according to basis of the law. So what uh, uh, what panels think think about this issue? Can we proceed to challenge the law in immediate? So thank you. You followed the question. Did yes. I any interview? You followed the question about right time, right code, right judge, <laughs> right case. <laughs> you have to keep that in mind. <laughs> this time you don't even have a code to approach. The, the, the codes that are operating now during the COVID phase, the virtual ones won't take up such complicated uh, issues at the moment. But we must always keep this in mind that this is the law that needs to be challenged. We will challenge it. We are prepared with our arguments and the more time is passing, our arguments are gaining more strength. They're gaining, they're getting stronger because realities are supporting us. You know, previously it was only our analysis. Now the examples are also supporting our arguments. But we have to wait for the right time. So we'll keep at it. And uh, Kazi Zahid, Iqbal, Iqbal, do you want to uh, come in on that? On Azad's question? Uh, just, just, just one sentence. Uh, supplement with the APA. Uh, that is, uh, if we don't go for the um, uh, whole law, at least two sections of the law is needed to be challenged. That is uh, section 9 and 10 which uh, uh, tells about the immunity. Uh, immunity should not be there. Immunity should not be there. And this immunity uh, creates room for the corruption. And that is the bad point of the law. Absolutely. Um, nothing and nobody can support immunity, uh, even by government officials or the government itself. Um, we are coming uh, to the last five minutes and therefore I think we should do um, what we planned, which is the winding down. And you know what I did? I completely forgot to get ourselves welcomed here. Um, oh, Donna has something. Uh, do you want to say what you're saying? And Ashok Chaudhary says very informative and interesting discussion. Um, Donna, do you want to um, say out what you have just typed? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, very clearly. Yes, Rizwana Appa, so nice to see you again. Um, I have a question for you. I very much understand, appreciate and agree with your analysis that the political realities need to be taken into account. Here's my question for you. Recently, we saw on a CBD uh, video, the power minister, Nasr Hamid, suggesting that perhaps they may limit coal power to 5,000 megawatts, which would mean basically limiting coal power to four coal plants, Bor Pecuria, which is already operational, Rampal, under construction, phase one, Fira phase one, already online almost, and Matabari phase one. Do you think that might be a signal that perhaps the political realities or winds may be shifting specifically with regard to coal power only? And perhaps that might mean some kind of legal challenge could be brought in the next year or so? In other words, is the political timing approaching a better circumstance than we've seen in the past? To be, should I? To be brief on that, you see, this is the result of the continuous hammering that we kept on doing, despite all the challenges that were put forward. So they're now thinking of limiting, but they haven't really abandoned. Uh, I think it is a time when you can take the discussion at a different level with the politicians, but I won't still say that this is the right time to go to the court with um, 
a case that we are uh, thinking about because in case we are turned down because you see the the bad elements they don't really die out and they're very organized much more organized than we are so i want personally speaking i want brave uh, to take a case now before the court but i would definitely see the opportunity to take the discussion at a different level with the political high ups legally i will still wait zahir dekhpal do you want to come in or jyotirmoyda no uh, i don't have any comment uh, apa rightly ex explain the things yes i think um, uh, we all know the reality that all our yes. um yes. Uh, south asian governments are still in love with coal yes, um, yes. you exactly. know even though we want to very much push it uh, away azad um, uh, brings it to the information um, of everyone here and for donna the japan's ministry of foreign affairs has confirmed that it has decided to proceed with a preparatory survey for jica um no by jica for the proposed phase 2 of the matarbari ultra super critical coal fired power plant here in uh, bangladesh so um uh, the fight is still uh, a long one and the road is uh, an even longer one um meanwhile today we need to sort of wind down but of course this is like um a discussion which is just the beginning of so many discussions as i said the next discussion is going to be about power projects um, that are have shared constituents across a border of india and uh, bangladesh um jyotirmoy do you want to come in i don't see you and i know that your cough is really troubling you do you want to come in or um uh, shall i go on to uh, the concluding remarks and i was apologizing also that i forgot to get mehdi bhai to uh, welcome us all <laughs> so maybe i should leave it to him to thank us all or something like that <laughs> but yes uh, zakir hosain um uh, will give us the concluding uh, remarks he is um, zakir hosain khan is honorary executive director change initiative bangladesh zakir khan oh jyotir mai do you want to speak before uh, zakir khan yes 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 one just one take it away yes in today's discussion obviously there are many other aspects of law um, we should have uh, brought into especially the bangladesh energy regulatory commission act 2003 because they are the regulating body and they have certain jobs to do which they are failing to do whatever criticism we are doing now it should have been overseen by them we uh, due to the time constraint obviously i could not bring those in so i had elaborate uh, uh, Repression on those particular law, but maybe next time. Um, there are certain uh, safeguards, and whenever you challenge, it is my personal experience. Uh, I challenge their um, inaction of the uh, commission, the uh, regulatory commission, that you are not taking action against it. For just for an example, in case of um, the price fixing of this LPG gas. the commission is supposed to fix the price according to this 2003 act but they are not doing it the private syndicates are fixing the prices when i challenged it they on oath said to the court that uh, if no one comes to us especially the licensee we cannot fix the price so the law cannot itself say that they are handicapped uh, in a way to provide protection to the people so these a sort of uh, provisions needs to be revisited and this drc act is also um, sh should be should be also under serious scrutiny for certain amendments and changes or challenges in the court as well so i will probably uh, bring this on in our uh, next discussion if, if uh, we need again uh, in this type of uh, discussion again um just just to add this yeah, thank you <clears throat> 
thank you jyotir maida and jyotir maida is committed through the school of people's law to continue working on this with the bangladesh working group on external debt and therefore the two of them uh, created this platform where we can really discuss openly and listen uh, to these three very eminent um, um, lawyers from the supreme court um, i now request um, zakir um, hussain to please um, do um, his duty today and thank you very much uh, vidya uh, for excellent uh, you know uh, this uh, moderation uh, as is well we lovely moderation we always enjoy and um, uh, i think it was a very rich discussion especially in terms of i would like to um, congratulate uh, the keynote speaker uh, bester jyotima bora who has pointed out and opened the discussions with the valid points and then what are the real uh, uh, opportunities and challenges that he has already primarily focused on and and obviously uh, then um, the origin of uh, she has actually uh, just uh, in just provided lots of aspects on the, what could be done or what could be the real political economic context and other Uh, issues regarding this the very crucial act which is really has created the opportunity for the corruptions and i i really appreciate uh, her very in depth analysis and finally dr zaid iqbal as uh, he has very precisely pointed out what could be the entry point and what could be the real uh, opportunity for us uh, to go proceed on i believe that these discussions will uh, uh, provide the next pathway to proceed to uh, together and what could be the real uh, uh, opportunity for on that the the uh, just before jumping into this concluding uh, some two or three points what my uh, understanding is that uh, that actually what is really uh, important to create some evidence why this sort of myopic thinking of the policy makers or the uh, corporations moving together jointly in terms of the expanding the coal based power plant generation in the whole south asia is it the problem of the south asian uh, countries policy makers or the corporates or the the, the global powers who are really actually like the japan china in in recently in india is coming up why are actually they thinking such myopic uh, money uh, way where the best cost effective and environmental friendly options are really available so we have to identify how can we just provide some evidence on that so that they create the demand of the people against those sort of the myopic decisions of this policy level and secondly because this is the always the Uh, Brazil up and uh, other people actually since 2012 we are just struggling with the rampal issue. Uh, we always tell the only we have a shundar only one shundar box. We cannot create another shundar box. Even li living apart from everything, uh, the benefits of the shundar box. If you just count the strong protection values and the rich biodiversity of the shundar box, you cannot think a single inter uh, establishment within the periphery of the shundar box. so this is particularly very much uh, uh, problematic for the uh, rational people why this sort of unwise and un, uh, you know uh, un, unprecedented example are creating by the policy maker so this is that's why i'm telling that we have to come up with the whole uh, south asian uh, and the beyond uh, the territory of the south asia uh, the, who are actually our friends together come up with the issues against the coal plant and we have to clear the evidence the real economic cost in terms of the real economic cost coal is the mighty cheap uh, mighty costlier than the uh, renewable energy if we can give the message properly at everywhere that would clear the evidence on that, that and that is the opportunity and i believe that uh, dr zaid iqbal has properly mentioned that, that the, we have to uh, challenge the Clause nine and ten actually not necessarily to uh, challenge the whole, whole act so that we can come up with the uh, concrete result because now the COVID situation has given us the, the opportunity that, that there is a little power demand right now in terms of the earlier so why this sort of uh, act actually will prevail so there is no uh, evidence to uh, uh, there is no proper evidence in favor of the government 
uh, to just uh, rule out our uh, prohibition. So these are the options. I believe that uh, and Bangladesh, uh, LNSP and sorry, Bangladesh working in a, a group on energy and development. Also, the LNSP is working on that. And we all together will come up to challenge in the right time, the, the hot the reason of the right time in the right moment with the right chance as well, because there are always the problem with the political interventions in, in the, and then the Supreme Court as well. So uh, uh, I would like to just conclude by some announcement that uh, we are the next meeting in the Bangla Energy Dialogue on Rampal, Reliance and Adani that would be held uh, on 20 or 21st of July. And uh, we are also preparing the China-Bangla Energy Dialogue, which is under preparations. Uh, we will announce soon uh, what would be the uh, next uh, date uh, for that sort of dialogue. And I believe that uh, the, and, and another uh, work, working group has uh, just prepared another, uh, you know, the uh, event or some sort of, uh, 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 you know, the intense uh, discussion, this is called Listen to Bangladesh, which is an initiative to organize the direct uh, meeting between the international actors and the affected communities. So uh, uh, I, uh, I would request to the all to the please just vote to select the projects which would be from which we want to listen. So uh, here, the, uh, the, uh, the people present and also the friends who didn't, uh, couldn't able to just join this meeting, uh, I request to all to just uh, give a vote so that we can hear the victims and uh, voices and uh, uh, with the intervention like that. So these are uh, the, our, uh, my uh, closing um, um, say, uh, um, remarks, but this is a really good start for the better options. And I believe we will really able to bet the coal and establish the renewable energy across the world. Thank you very much for joining with us. Thank you, Zakir Hussain uh, Saab, because um, uh, I think as ED of Change Initiative, he's seen that, uh, you know, um, change needs everybody to work hard. And I think while we've been talking about the right bench at the right time, etc., uh, we I'll call upon the, the right man, actually. He's put uh, activists who wanted legal inputs and activists, uh, lawyers, you know, lawyers who are really activists at heart together. And I think this synergy was brought about by what I'm calling the right man, Hassan Mehdi, who put this um, platform together for us. Sorry, Mehdi, I forgot to ask you to welcome us. So please, you have your one minute to say what you want to us. And then we, I mean, you can end it. Thank you very and, much. And don't forget, Nana na, Mehdi, you must show everyone your T-shirt. Ek to <laughs> I no, will no. have the pleasure uh, of reading it. I think it's Shift okay. Your ass from oil, coal, coal and gas. It says. I think okay, Mehdi. <laughs> thank, uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for coming here and join us uh, in this uh, in short notice and. Uh, you know, I got. I am. I am so fortunate that I got uh, uh, Jyotir Moida, uh, Rizwan Apa, and Jahid Iqbal Bhai together on a single day for a single time. And so it's it's the right time, right place, and right person. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you know, I have some uh, some memory with uh, uh, Jyotir Moida. We started talking about uh, uh, the ADB immunity in 2018, and we sat many many times uh, to get that right. Time, right uh, place, and right uh, situation, right zag, etc. And uh, that was that was nice. We we sat uh, sat several times. I have I have more memory with Rizonapa. Uh, we we visited intensively to the remote areas of Babodaho, waterlogged area, which is uh, which uh, which is a result of uh, ADB project called KZDRP, and also to the Sundar remote areas of Sundarbans to challenge the. Uh, another ADB project, SBCP, Sundarban Biodiversity Conservation Project. We got uh, Zahid Iqbal uh, Bhai here, who is also you know, a senior lawyer in Supreme Court. Uh, we got around 32 participants from uh, Bangladesh and uh, India, Japan, China, uh, Hong Kong, Philippines, uh, Canada, USA, UK, Germany, and these countries. Thank you, everybody, to uh, come here and join us and, and your zeal to support us. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for uh, attending here. Thanks once again.
Bye-bye all. Thank you again. Um, and hope to see you again very soon.